is that over 20 years? Oh, thanks. Um, Mark has over 20 years of experience in arts marketing, operational leadership, and executive management, uh, media sales, and communications. He's also an artist and holds a bachelor's degree in fine arts from the Columbus College of Art and Design. Mark is the founder and principal consultant for Cardwell Communications, as well as the founder of the nonprofit Ohio Marketing Association. Uh, Mark also serves on the board of the Ohio Association of Nonprofit Organizations, which Adoption Network Cleveland has been a member of for many, many years. Um, and uh, Mark is an adoptee. After living in um, five different foster homes, he was adopted at the age five. I think he'll probably be telling us a little bit more about his story this evening. Um, when the records were unsealed here in Ohio in 2015, um, Mark searched and uh, was reunited with his birth family after about 50 years of separation. Um, since then, I've had the privilege of getting to know Mark and following his journey. And, uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Mark Carvel. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Betsy. I, I really appreciated it. And it's, um, it's really my honor uh, to be here and to spend this time with you and everyone and um, uh, to share uh, on this topic. I, um, I thought maybe I would do um, a little bit of a, a background on, on my adoption journey, just to kind of give you uh, some context of um, uh, where I'm sharing from, uh, because we all have- Be on video or not be on video? I'm gonna choose not to be on video. Different uh, places uh, and spaces that we come from, so. I will get started here and just um, give you a little bit of context of where I'm, where I'm sharing from. Uh, like uh, Betsy said, I, um, I was adopted at the age of five or so. And um, I have pretty good recollection of some things. Um, and not so great recollection of, of others. Um, what, I, what I have come to understand is a little bit better what was happening in uh, my birth household uh, that caused uh, myself and my siblings to be separated from our mother. Um, but sometime in August of 1965, I arrived on the scene and um, from what I understand, my I thought, and I always grew up, I grew up for a long time believing it was just me and another sibling, because I always remembered I had a sister. But apparently I was the last of uh, five, <laughs> the last of five, and I had older siblings. And so when I, um, I embarked on my search and I found uh, this, just a whole group of people. Uh, it was really quite, quite a shock to me because I had always thought about finding my mother and my sister, but I just didn't know there was anybody else. Apparently there was just everybody. Um, uh, but part of what kind of gives me context for this discussion is the fact that being so young, I had a very spotty memory. And um, there's some things that I could recollect from the different homes that I was in, but I couldn't tell you a, a lot of detail, but I could tell some things were going on. I have um, some pretty good recollection of the, the foster home that I was in prior, but I, I realized I moved around a lot, actually. Um, we were separated, I was around three years old. And in between that time of three and five, I was in so many different places. And I just remember that being, um, um, yeah, a thing. Um, well, I come to find out uh, from speaking with uh, someone 50 something years later that uh, part of the issue was my, my, uh, my birth mother was always finding me <laughs> and, and, um, and hassling my, uh, my foster parents. And so that, that, that was, um, that, kind of made me want to understand more <laughs> about uh, what was going on in those days. And so um, 
what I wanted to share with you, with you all, uh, just as a thought as we get started, is that feeling that I had uh, is is this this kind of um, spotty recollections because I was younger. Um, a lot of people have. And so what happens is you have questions. And so I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of what that might feel like. And, I'm, and, I, and I was thinking about it and I said, well, how can I kind of explain what that feels like as a, a, a young adopted kid in a new family? What does it feel like? And I said, oh, here's a good, a good one. Um, imagine, if you would, imagine. Uh, you go to the library or you're, you download something or you get an order your book from a book from Amazon or put a book and you want to you, you can't wait to get it and you really want to read the book and um, you, um, you get the book and you want to get into it, you know, and uh, imagine that the book when you open it has no preface and uh, no chapter one no chapter two, just start somewhere, chapter three, something like that, somewhere in the middle of chapter three. <laughs> but you're, that's literally where the, the story starts. Imagine how, um, how disappointing that might be to try to understand uh, the, the context of the book, the, you know, without having the beginning of it. You know, that's what it feels like to be six, seven, eight, nine, and, and, and not really have a great context for your, your beginnings. Another example that I thought would work pretty well um, is uh, if you could imagine uh, listening to music. How many of you know that a lot of times when your favorite song comes on, you know right away from the introduction, the way the song comes on. Artists and musicians spend a lot of time figuring out the introduction to the song. <laughs> yeah, making a good entrance with the music. Well, imagine you go to listen to your favorite song and it doesn't have an introduction. It just starts somewhere in the middle of the melody. It just starts in the middle. It's hard to, understand the whole song without hearing it from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought about my kids and, and I thought about how I used to read them stories, you know, fairy tales when they were little. And uh, they don't know, I'd, I'd read them to them today if they asked me to, I'd be so happy to. <laughs> but when they were little and I'd be in bed and I'd read them the, you know, the fairy tales that you get and they're four and five like that. And um, imagine a, a fairy tale that doesn't have that ubiquitous beginning once upon a time. And then all the language that goes into setting the scene of the story before it gets into the moral of the story. There's a beginning. Well, you know, imagine not having that once upon a time. It just starts. Somewhere Jack is halfway up the beanstalk. You have no idea anything about the beans. We don't know anything about the cow. We don't know anything. Somehow he's just, he's just it just starts there. That's what it feels like. That's what it felt like um, to be my stage and my age. Um, and no one want to talk about or converse about or discuss my my early years um what happened what set the beginning of my story you know my song and so what happens is as you might imagine um you have questions i had questions but i was young and i didn't know how to ask ask those questions. I didn't know if I could ask those questions or if I was allowed to <laughs> ask those questions, you know. Um, and so they just remained missing until I began to get older. And then I began to kind of hint around, <laughs> you know, kind of nudge and 
probe <laughs> and uh, I would maybe get some of that pushback and I would, you know, go back a little bit on that and say, man, I'll try again, maybe <laughs> a different day. But I never, I never, and, I, and I'm sure many people never, when you don't have that story, you still want it. It's always, the, it's, the, it's always a missing piece and you have those questions and those questions don't go away just because they're not answered. And just because we don't want to have that discussion or it's a difficult discussion and you're not sure how to have it with the child at that time when I was a child. Then when I became a teenager, I began to be a little bit more forthright about asking and I began to get some more answers. Um, but even then, um, my, my uh, parents were not clear um, one more than the other. <laughs> um, and so I knew even then that, that was, it was not a conversation that my parents wanted to have, but I still had the questions. I still wanted to understand the beginning of my song. I wanted to know what my once upon a time was like. I wanted to hear, you know, how I came to be and how I came to be with them. And so anyway, um, these issues don't go away just because it's hard to talk about. And I had said in our kind of our, our discussion, it would be great if I could go back. You know, both of my adoptive parents are gone now. Uh, and um, I miss them terribly. Um, and when I think about them, I think about how, how difficult it was for them to try to start a family, right? With me, my brother who was also adopted. Um, and, and then just start <laughs> from there. And so we didn't have like, uh, we had the best Christmases. We had the most amazing mom and dad in the world, you know, uh, we, we, you know, but there was this thing that was always not discussed. And that was like, how, you, how did we, how did, what is our backstory? It was just one of those things you didn't, we didn't talk about, but I never was um, satisfied with not knowing I wasn't. Well, I thought maybe today I'd, I'd share some thoughts. So if I could go back and share with my mom and dad some techniques, <laughs> you know, that might help us both deal with the uncomfortable and difficult conversations. Um, and, and now that I know more, I understand why they were uncomfortable. <laughs> I get it. Um, some things are not age appropriate, right? And so when I was eight, nine, and wanted to understand, there was only so much that you could probably really tell me. If you weren't, if my parents weren't letting me watch our movies, right, then most of my <laughs> My background story was really, you know, you know, something that they needed to kind of temper, you know, um, and I understand that, yeah. But there's 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 a way, and I'm, what I want to do is give you and discuss with you some some things that if I could go back and share with them, I think would help us both. And I hope that kind of gives you some context. Uh, where I'm sharing from. Um, regardless of what stage of the adoption journey um, we're in, the one thing that we have to have is, it says, I think this is kind of a scientific word, I'm not sure, but um, I've seen it in journals, but it's something called emotional intelligence. It's, it's, it, it helps you to begin to have this other very needed thing to help us get to being able to converse with one another about difficult things. And it's, uh, it's called empathy. Yeah. And I know my parents loved me, but I don't think they could ever put themselves in my shoes. 
And I think that if they had been able to put themselves in my shoes, they would have understood the necessity for some conversation and some discussion about how I came to be with them and, and what they really um, knew about it. And, and so I have three, four things that I wanna share that I hope we get a chance to discuss uh, together. And interestingly, I've used this in a, a discussion with um, leaders um, learning how to uh, have tough discussions with their staffs, interestingly. Um, but the first thing is self-awareness. Emotional intelligence requires um, that you not only be able to perceive emotions, understand emotions and manage them, you also have to be able to use them. And one of the things we have to be able to do is have some self-awareness, spend some time getting to understand where you are. I spent a lot of time with myself uh, as a kid, as a young man. And I spent a lot of time looking in the mirror trying to understand myself, understand my motives, understand my intent. Did I really want the right thing? <laughs> Could I look at myself and, and feel like I was really, you know, um, for the right thing? What was, what was really going on with me? How was I really feeling? When we're gonna have these tough discussions with, with with each other, I think it's important that we know where we're coming from, that we've had and taken some time to, to get, how do I, how am I feeling in my own thoughts? What are my motives? How am I reacting? And just get in touch, get in touch and be self-aware. You know, my, my, um, my adopted mother, anytime the conversations would come up, she would bristle. And she, it would, it would visibly frustrate her that we, you know, that it was coming up. And and I don't think my my mom really had a, um, you know, she didn't want to to think about how she felt and what her real motive was. She just wanted to get through that moment as quickly as possible, and then we could go back to not thinking about that. And, you know, so that's something that I think is vitally important. Everybody, both the, the adoptee and the adoptive parents, foster parents, everybody just have some time and take some, get to understand how you are feeling. Number two is to actually practice empathy. And I mentioned it earlier in, while we were, while I was giving you my, my preamble to the context for where I'm sharing from, but um, this idea of imagine you are the other person. Imagine you are the other person. Imagine you're the one that has the missing piece, the missing puzzle, the no first chapter, you know, imagine that you're that. And, and vice versa, for me, when I'm dealing with my now, my, my birth father, I wanna put myself in his shoes. Imagine, you know, that I'm, I'm him. And I have a son who, who I didn't raise, but now I'm glad he's in my life, but there's, there's he's gotta have questions. Yeah, but maybe you don't want him to know. You know, how did I? I put myself in my, in his shoes so that I can be sensitive, so that we can actually have a, a conversation that's not fraught with conflicts. That was number two. Number three, and I think this is actually really really important. Um, 
a lot of the conflict and the problems that we have in, pre in having these tough discussions and conversations about these issues and topics or topics around our, our journey, uh, there's fear involved. Fear in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Somebody's afraid of something. And uh, they say it's good if we label it, if we call it out, if we bring it out, if we deal with it, if we look at it and we label it so that we can begin to diffuse its, uh, its power and, and, and try, to, try, to, try to grab a hold of it and say that, you know what? I'm afraid that if I tell you this, you're going to that. Or I'm afraid that if you, you tell me this, that I'm going to feel that, or I'm afraid that if I ask you and you don't tell me, then I'm gonna feel, you know, but there's fear involved in all of this. And a thing that will help us is to grab a hold of it. And the other thing is to recognize that when there's fear, there's often not far uh, anger. And the anger obviously does not create a great space and place for conversation. So it's important that we call out the fears so that we can diffuse its power and begin to quell the anger. That was number three. Number four. a tactic, and this is actually my favorite one, and that is to, to be real. <laughs> and this is really important. Um, honesty in conveying your feelings is very, very important. The one thing I know about me as a kid growing up, and I think a lot of adoptees, is that our survival oftentimes depends on being able to discern this in genuine people, All right? It, it, it's not really something that um, is an option for some of us who have been in different homes. The first thing that you, you, you have to do is understand if you're safe or not. <laughs> and so trust is a big thing. And trust has to be with all people and is, is, is earned, but, but we especially test it and we look for holes in the armor. We, we, we are very um, adept at noticing when you didn't really mean it. <laughs> you said it because it was the right thing to say. Well, we, we're good at that. We learned that in the system. Yes, ma'am. And yes, sir. And no, ma'am. And, and we know that. We know how to say the right things. But then that little cut of the eyes or that little thing, then we, then we saw that maybe there's some chance that you don't really mean it. And that's important for us to know <laughs> because we are in your hands, All right? So be real. And, and, and the part I wanted to say is this, this authenticity disarm so that you can look for uh, real connection because everybody can notice when it's not there, okay? And then there's, there's one other thing I wanna share. That I, it's hard to, 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 to not to share it without having a, um, a diagram, but I'll explain it to you. There are on the spectrum of empathy, which is really what we're talking about, which will help us have better uh, conversations and deal with difficult uh, discussions. There's four things. There's pity, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. The closer you get to compassion, the more effort it takes, but the deeper the understanding and the engagement will be. Right before that is empathy. It takes a lot of the effort, but you'll have a deeper understanding and engagement between the two of you. Sympathy hmm, doesn't take as much effort to say, I, I feel sorry for what's going on. 
And pity definitely doesn't take any effort either. And those two have the least ability to generate understanding and engagement. But empathy and compassion. It does take the most effort, but it gets you the most gain. It gets you what you really came for, which is understanding on both sides and engagement through the discussion and through the topics and through the conversation. So I hope that gives us some fodder for discussion and maybe these tips can be used uh, to help you navigate these, uh, to help us all really navigate these tough conversations. And with that, looking at the time, I'm happy to take any questions or reaction. Thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, as I think I told you, we had a couple of questions that were submitted with um, registration. So before even people got to hear what you had to say, um, and they're good questions. So uh, if, if folks here this evening have questions, please put them in chat and we'll get to those in a couple of minutes. But we'll start with these. Um, so the first one was um, the person saying, I like to describe search and reunion as a quest or adventure. Um, what have been the prizes of this quest for you? Uh, were there prizes you sought but haven't been able to bring back from the quest? I love that analogy as well, because I think as, as a kid, I figured myself a pirate. So I often, and I was, I'm always on that, that fantastic journey anyway. So yeah, I get that. Um, uh, so prizes, yeah, I, I mean, I was looking for uh, my mother and a sister and I ended up with, um, you know, two brothers and two sisters and a father that I had no idea. So, so yeah, there was a whole um, great, terrific uh, family. My siblings really made me, uh, embraced me and my siblings um, really made me to understand they filled a, a hole that was there for me. My, my adopted brother and, my, and myself never really connected. He, he wasn't that happy because I got adopted after. He wasn't that happy that I was, I was in the picture. And so we never really had that kind of a brotherly thing. We were brothers. But um, my siblings, when I found my birth siblings, it, I, could, I could feel things that I never felt before between uh, them that I could feel the connection. And, I hadn't, and it was foreign for me, new, new for me and different. And so that was something that, I, that is something that I treasure. My eldest brother, I could feel he was my eldest brother. <laughs> so I could feel it. And uh, he wasn't just a guy off the street. He could, he did indeed, he, 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 um, his presence hit something in the back of my brain that said, I know him. And when he told me, he told me stories and he taught me how to read and, and distinguish things, patterns and things like that. I could feel that connection with him. Yeah, so those were great, great prizes. Now, what did I, what did, what did I seek and not get? Not find, seek and not find. Um, I still don't really feel like, you know, my, my birth mother has gone on and she did her best. She, I got to hear her tell me she loved me. That was worth everything. Uh, I got to feel her touch, you know, I got to, see the look in her eyes. I got this, what, look, see how she looked at me. That was everything. Um, I don't know if I needed anything else from her, but my birth father is, is um, what, I guess the prize that I haven't gotten is I haven't heard anyone tell me what was going on in 1965. <laughs> what were you doing in between 1965 and 1970? that caused both my, my, our, our, my sister and me to be uh, separated from our family. Uh, where were you? <laughs> what were you doing? What were you thinking? Why, why did you make the decision to go back you know, into the service? No, I haven't, heard, I haven't heard answers to some of those questions. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to. That was a good question. 
Um, so as a follow-up, I need to ask, have you tried to bring that topic up with him or? Um... Yeah, well, yeah um, he is really uh, cagey. He's just cagey. Yeah. But I tell you what, uh, Betsy, he's telling me, but he is so smart and um, uh, he's quite brilliant. He, he knows you want, he knows I want to know, but he's not gonna tell me when I want to. Out of the blue, he'll start talking about something uh, that he was doing uh, when he was living you know, down here. And I'll have to grab a pencil and pad and paper and start listening to the dates that he's giving because that, that's, actually he, that's actually him telling me what I need to know, <laughs> that he knows I need to know. But he has to do it in a way that, you know, not direct. It's, mm -hmm. He's telling me another story, but the story about him trying to get a job and doing such and such and such just happened to be around the same time that all the turmoil was going on with us. Mm -hmm. I'll miss it if I don't pay attention. <laughs> Yeah. Take up take enough notes and piece them together, maybe I'll yeah. get yeah. the picture. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, so another question. Um, what advice do you have for an adoptee starting the first conversation with their adoptive parents about wanting to search for their birth family? Yeah, you know, my situation was um by the time I was, what was I, 50? Um and when I heard about it, I was, I was just, I was so excited about the opportunity because I had looked, I just, there was just no way you could do anything with the records being closed. I was able to really be, I, could, I just told my mom what I was gonna do. <laughs> um, I knew that she didn't, didn't like it, but she also could see that I was excited about it. And so she wasn't gonna try to stop me from doing it or anything. Or, like that, it wasn't that kind of a thing. Um, but I think that that what I would want to do is have that part, that part where um, you put yourself in the other person's place, and like, and and so oh wait, and then I realize that you know what, when I say I'm excited to look for my birth family, mom hears he's wanting to leave this family. And see, I had never thought of it like that, but I realized that was a fear. See, we go back to that. That was a fear that she had, and that's what caused her to get angry and to push back. What I would do differently now is address that first. And I would say, you know, you may, you may feel that I'm wanting to find my birth family because I am unhappy with this, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm extremely happy and I'm not looking to replace. I'm not looking, you know, that sort of thing is what I would do. I would make sure to, to kind of just bring out in the open any fears that you think that there might be and just, and just kind of quell them if you can. Um, so we had another question. Um, specific to your adoptive family. So let me skip to that one. Um, how did reconnecting with your birth family affect your relationship with your adoptive parents or did it, if you're willing to share? You know, um, it, it was good. You know, the, the one thing, it, it wasn't perfect. Um, what, ha what happened was for, for me, I was getting married around the same time. And my my uh, fiance then, and then uh, now we actually had planned to get married in Ghana, but then I found my birth family, and and we decided that this would be kind of a perfect opportunity to get everybody invited, <laughs> right, and have it at the church, and so that's what we did, and so um, my uh, my birth mother, who was in a nursing home at the time, and my my adoptive mother. Uh, got to come to the to the wedding together along with my wife's family and everything, and um, they sat at the table where the parents sit, and um, and I noticed that uh, my mother and my my mother and my mother uh, sat next to each other, and um, I could see my mom, my adoptive mom, caring for my um, 
my birth mother who was in a wheelchair and, and needed some help at that time. She needed some help eating and so forth. And so that, that, that helped that circumstance. Then my siblings came over to the house that my mom, and at least most of my siblings did, not all of them did, but most, and, they, and that went pretty good. Um, my mom was still, she's, she, you know, if I could do her body language, she was still guarded about them, right? Because there was a, there was a, you know, my, my birth family, they're not from the right side of the tracks, you might say. And so my mom had some, there was some things I could tell that she felt, you know, that, that um, but other, other than that, everybody gave her a lot of respect and, and so, and, and, and she, um, she never really said anything that was, you know, really bad or out of the way or anything like that. And so, and um, for a long time, not to get off of this, but um, I had, a, when I found my birth family, there was a big picture of all of us together and it was huge. It was blown. And my, my adoptive mom insisted, insisted, because I, I, I'm still having issues finding my family. So it's like, I love my family. I'm glad I found them. I don't know if I want a picture of them in the living room just yet, <laughs> right? Because, and, but that's where my mother insisted <laughs> that it would be. And so I found that very interesting. So who knows what that really was about? <laughs> but I guess, and it, it went well, it was okay. It actually went, it was not bad. Well, I can just picture the scene at the wedding that you're talking about. I know in my own reunion, that was one of the most touching moments is um, when my birth mother and my adoptive mother met and hugged and thanked each other. And I became whole in a way that I don't think I even knew it was missing until I witnessed that. Yeah. Um, special. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it brings up a lot of other things. I was like, hmm, because, you know, I was being super sleuth. So I found out that they both did hair, graduated from the same place. My my uh, adoptive mom was only 10 years older than my birth mom, but they worked right next to each other. I, Y'all can say you didn't know each other if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so another question that we had is, um, uh, how would you, or how do you prepare for possible rejection um, when you want to have a difficult conversation, but you also want to be true to your authentic self? Wow, that's, that's a terrific question. I think, I think I was, I have been prepared for rejection for a long time. Um, so I, I, I never, I never thought of it as a, um, as something that would have been my problem. So if, if I were rejected, say for example, by my, my birth father, if um, he didn't, for example, want to see me, want to meet me, because after I found my birth mother, I didn't know he existed and he, and he found out I existed. Um, we met at a restaurant. I didn't know how it was gonna go, you know. Um, I didn't know if he was gonna come. And so I was wonder how, how will I feel if he doesn't come? And, and, and that's a terrific question because it stops and stutters people from, from making those maybe decisions to, to reach out sometimes that the fear of rejection. But I never felt, I never felt like it was my problem. Whatever happened, I didn't do it. <laughs> so I don't feel like I was bad because um, they had problems figuring out how to raise the children and how to do the things that they needed to do. I never owned that. I know it's not my problem. So conversely, if you quote unquote reject me, that's still not my problem. I'm, I'm still viable. I'm still valuable. I'm still wonderful. It's you have a problem. It's not my problem. So that's how I approached it. And it, and it, and it so it never really, never really stopped. It wouldn't stop me. In fact, it probably drove me. I wasn't afraid of rejection at all. Been so alone, been alone. Um, there's rejection, like the relationship might not work out, but then there's also, and I, this might be what the questioner was asking, like in the context of a specific discussion that, you know, so maybe you have acceptance in your overall relationship, but if you're asking a question that's going to rock the boat, you know, um, were there things that you were scared to bring up? And if so, how did you power through? <laughs> you know, um, mm, 
you know, you just test the waters. I mean, I, I, I just fit, I just found out like my, my dad, for example, he is really um, on some other kind of stuff. Sometimes he's real laid back until you say something that is a cue for him. We were on the road to Steubenville and we started talking about something that involved um, my, my mother, uh, Kay, uh, my, my birth mother. Um, and uh, just, I just said my mom. And he just barked back at me, which, which mother, <laughs> you know? And I was like, okay, well, all right. Um, I see. Let me, let me just kind of watch how I, <laughs> how I navigate things with him. And um, I think that's what I, my, my solution is just to kind of watch and listen and, and, and try to temper the moment so that I know what the buttons are. <laughs> Mm. that's going break them down that's yeah. it yep oh that was my question about the rejection mm -hmm. yeah I, can, can i just put a clarifier in there so i asked that mainly because as adoptees we always feel this that you know there could be abandonment or you know not being accepted and the whole belongingness you know those always come up for us so you know, just trying to get your mindset ready, just in yes. case. Yes, yeah, just in case. That's, I mean, so here's, here's, here, here's my thing. This is me. I felt isolated when I was, uh, um, I, I was by myself. I didn't, I didn't have this context for birth family. So um, even though you get adopted sometimes, that doesn't mean that you feel like you're really a part of everything that's going on. I mean, I'm adopted, but adoption really is a process as far as I'm concerned. It's like, it takes a long time. So I felt isolated and alone. And, and I think one of my defense mechanisms has been that I, for a long time, I said that I had to be, pre I had to be prepared um, to be at any moment potentially alone by myself. And so I kind of got myself, I don't, I don't really see things as necessarily, um, I don't see that as a, um, a state that I wouldn't be familiar with. And, and I'm not at all saying that that's healthy. I'm saying that that was my uh, survival tactic, that I decided that at any given moment, I could be alone. So rejection actually wasn't as, as um, a big of a, uh, a, a scary factor for me because I had, I, I had been abandoned before. It could happen again. I, and that's how I kind of dealt. Does that help? Yeah, it does. And, you know, I was, I was one of those anxious attachment types. So I'm mm -hmm. transitioning to secure attachment. So that, that helps you stay more grounded. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thank you. I got you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank yep. you, Mark. Thank mm -hmm. you, Bethany. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Um, I have one more question. And if anybody else has questions, we're going to have a little time. So feel free to put them in chat. But Mark, I'm... Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how, how you remember your parents telling you about being adopted and was it a one-time event that they just kind of mentioned it or was it an ongoing conversation? It sounds like it wasn't their favorite topic. So how was that handled at home? Well, you know, I was old enough when I was adopted to know that I was adopted. Um, I remember being at the court uh, with, um, with them and, and uh, I remember talking with the judge and the judge you know, the final um, thing being being done. I remember meeting them prior to that with my social worker at um, a place called Children's Palace where they have toys. So they got to observe me in the wild, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and so, uh, and I got to see them and, and, but we didn't, we weren't, we didn't talk, but I got to, you know, that sort of thing. And so, um, so I knew I was adopted. Um, what happened after that, that's it, is we just never talked about it. We never discussed it. I just had all of these questions all the time. And it was just one of those things that wasn't talked about. And, and so that's why I say I was like, you know, a song without the beginning and, and, and a, the fairy tale without the once upon a time set up. So finally, when I was in my teenage years, I got more forthright about it. I had a, actually had a, it's a weird way to answer this question, but I kept, all my friends that I had were girls. I kept trying to make them my sister. And I said one day, I know I have a sister. And I brought that up to my parents. And that's when they told me, 
um, that yes, I did indeed have a sister and they had thought about adopting her with me, um, but uh, the reason they didn't is they didn't have enough room in the house that they were looking for and all that, something like that. And, um, but it really helped me to know that I, that thing, that feeling that I had, that, that feeling of loss and, and what I was missing wasn't just something made up in my head. I was missing my sister. And I only come to find out that as my sister told me, we were very close. And uh, it, gets, it gets really sad when I talk about, you know, uh, us being in Franklin County and, you know, when we were first separated and the only way I could fall asleep is if I was touching her. So he would scoot our cribs together. <laughs> and reach out and touch each other so that we could come. That was my sister and I really needed her. And so I really felt some kind of way that one, they didn't adopt her. And the reason was really shallow to me. And the fact that they knew all that, all these years and never told me, yeah. How much older than you is she? Oh, just a year, a year older and okay. a year and a couple of months. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'm so glad she's in my life now. Mm -hmm. um, that was a big, big, big puzzle piece <laughs> that came back to me. So if you were younger when you were adopted, do you think mm -hmm. maybe your parents wouldn't have even told you? You know, we have this whole- oh, I, I, Actually, seriously, yeah, I don't think they would have told me. Uh -huh. um, no, they, they wouldn't have. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't. Now, my father was a bit different. My father had siblings. My mother was an only child. And I think my mother didn't understand the connection, the sibling connections. And my father had, um, you know, many brothers and sisters. And so he actually, that same day that I was talking to them about that, my dad, I could, he wanted to tell me more. And I saw my mother kind of shush him up. And so um, that that's how that happened. And even up until just, you know, uh, recently, um, my mother held things back from me. That, and I was saying in my thing that she shared with my wife, but she didn't share with me. Um, that's just, you know, what it was for her. She really would have rather that we never talked about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, the Children's Palace thing, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's a whole um, I don't know, you know, there's matching or there's, you know, the way that adoptive parents get connected with the kids that they adopt in the public system primarily. Um, so sometimes they have a mixer where, you know, the kids go somewhere and play and the, you know, potential parents watch and, you know, kind of check them out. Did, was it, was it a group thing like that or was it just like an individual? Do you remember? It was just an individual. I re, as I recall, a social worker took me to children. I was just happy to go to Children's Palace. <laughs> and I saw this couple standing in the aisle. She told me, you know, who they were and all of that. And then I think I was just supposed to go walk by them. They weren't going to talk to me or anything. They were just, and, then, and that was it. But I was just, I was really, really focusing on the toys. Um, but I did, I did that moment i can almost in my mind i can see them standing in the in the in the aisle and watching me so you kind of knew they were there to check you out oh yeah yeah i did know that i did know that see by that time i had been pretty well schooled on yes ma'am and no ma'am and no sir and, and all of that and don't you want somebody to you want to, you want them to like you <laughs> all of that sort of thing yeah hmm. no. Um, okay, well, I don't know that we have any, does anybody else have any more questions? We've got a few minutes left if anybody wants to type something in or, oh, there's one that I almost missed. Um, somebody had an open adoption. They were very fortunate, but open adoption, good relationship with their son's, their five-year-old son's birth mother. Mm. Um, his birth mother is now expecting a baby girl in February and plans to raise her um, as she's now in a happy, steady relationship. Any advice that you can share about um, helping this parent in conversations with her son about the birth mother having a child that she's going to parent? No. Oh. <laughs> Complicated Ooh. situations. <laughs> um, no, I have no. I, I, well, I'll tell you what, I think the thing about it, and just going back to some of the things we said, this honesty part, um, like, 
to be able to talk honestly and depending upon the age of the of the child what's age appropriate and what they can actually understand and comprehend and really get people um life happens to them and they they have struggles and problems and you know that's what was happening with my my people and they were significant and sometimes they're significant enough that they are not able to be the parent you know even if they want to be at that time but then time passes and then they get in a better position in a better mind state in a better place in a better space and then they are able to parent and i think that just being honest that that's what happens that it, it, it's and that's what happened and um you're in a great position to be able to maintain a connection a relationship yeah. but honesty that helps that's great any last questions anybody want to come off mute and ask a question mm -hmm. we got a quiet group tonight yeah um well then i guess we'll wrap things up so um you're getting some thanks in the chat already. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat here. Um, we do a very brief program evaluation, so it's helpful for us if people don't mind taking just a couple minutes to an answer. It's just a few questions. And so you can click through and do that. And um, Mark, I just I want to thank you um, so much for sharing your wisdom and your feelings and your thoughts um, with us tonight. Um, really, really good to hear your perspectives and um, I, I really appreciate that. So um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And um, as most of you probably know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization. We serve individuals, families and um, agencies impacted by adoption and foster care through support education and advocacy. To find out more about our organization and to support our work, you can check out our website, which is adoptionnetwork.org. I've been putting in the chat. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we will continue on. This is the only uh, Monday evening that we're having in December, just because of the way the holidays fall, but we will be continuing on in January. Um, so watch for what we post for January 10th. and. Uh, and we'll have several after that as well. Um, so thank you. And I very much appreciate you joining us this evening. Have a good rest of the night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh. <laughs>